Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Ashley. I do event coordination for Firestorm Books and Coffee, and I'm really looking forward to hosting what should be a very fascinating and informative conversation today. Um, so this afternoon, in collaboration with UNC Asheville's English department, uh, we have Dr. Maggie M. Werner, a sex worker rights activist and rhetoric professor, in conversation with UNCA professor Amanda Ray, as well as UNC Asheville gender and sexuality students. Um, before we dive into the event, I just want to take a moment to share a few bits of information about our bookstore. For folks who aren't familiar, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a collectively owned radical bookstore and community event space in so-called Asheville, North Carolina on occupied Cherokee territory. Our project turns 13 years old in a few months, in a few months, which is pretty exciting. And our bookstore features a selection of general interest titles, as well as a wide spectrum of political thought with a focus on queer, feminist, and anarchist voices and culture. As an event space, uh, we host readings, workshops, film screenings, and presentations as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations and projects. Unfortunately, since the start of the pandemic, our doors have remained closed to the public, which hopefully uh, will change in a couple months here and we'll be opening those doors again soon. Um, so we shifted our operation to a most, mostly virtual experience, which means we sell books online through our website, and if you've not picked up Dr. Warner's book yet, uh, you can do so there. So it's been a pretty weird and difficult year to say the least, but at Firestorm, we've been humbled by the way folks have shown up to support us. And it's been a really cool experience to expand our reach to shipping books to people all across the country and around the world. Um, so if you haven't yet, do check us out um, at our website, www.firestorm.coop. Um, we've also had a lot of success in converting our community programming to online virtual events. So if you're wanting more opportunities to attend these kinds of discussions, as well as other author events and book clubs, or you just want to, uh, you just appreciate the work that we do and you want to ensure our continued existence, you can sign up for our community sustainers program on Patreon, where a small monthly contribution helps uh, support us to continue putting resources toward creating content like this, um, as well as offers you a 10% discount on all purchases from our store. So for folks who are interested in any of that, uh, I'll drop links to all of these things in the chat and in the comments section for those who are following on the live stream. Um, as for today, uh, we, like I said, have a really fascinating event for you uh, where Dr. Werner will open the event with a brief summary of her new book, Stripped, which examines the ways in which erotic bodies communicate in performance and as cultural figures. Um, after a brief presentation by Dr. Werner, uh, we are going to open it up uh, to, for Q&A. Um, so just one thing to note there for folks who are in attendance today on Zoom, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions uh, throughout the discussion. Um, if you just look down at the bottom of your screen there, there's a Q&A function. And if you click on that, you can submit your question. Um, I'll go ahead and encourage you to submit questions throughout the event. Um, there's no reason to hold back until Maggie finishes up with their portion. So if anything uh, strikes your interest or inspires a question you, please submit that question through the Q&A function. Um, and we've actually got a 
UNCA student here, Jessica Matone, uh, who is a junior at UNCA from Charlotte and is majoring in women, gender, and sexuality studies. Um, and Jessica will be moderating that Q&A section of tonight's event, uh, or today's event. Um, so great. I think that's it for me. Um, I am now going to pass it over to Amanda Ray, who is a professor, a professor of English at UNC at Asheville, um, and whose work covers many areas, including oral history, feminism, rhetorics of inclusion and equity, visual rhetoric, professional writing, research methods, gender and sexuality studies, and creative nonfiction. Um, and we're super grateful to Amanda for reaching out to us at Firestorm to organize uh, this event and this collaboration. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Amanda. Thank you, Firestorm, for hosting us. I wish that we were all gathered around the tables in your back room and getting to have some tea. Um, but thank you very much to uh, Maggie Warner for joining us. Um, Maggie is an associate professor of writing and rhetoric at Hobart and William Smith colleges. Um, I met Maggie in graduate school um, and at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, she continues to be just a wonderful feminist friend as exhibited by helping me, but as showing up in this capacity to um, elevate and amplify um, the voices for sex worker rights and to um, bring this information to my classroom with my students. Um, and so we thank Maggie so much for coming. Uh, she continues to be a very generous reader of my own writing and I'm grateful for that partnership that we have to share work. Um, I got to read some of her book before it came out in print, um, which is always just so generous for a writer to do. Um, and so we thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you to my gender and sexuality students at UNC Asheville for helping to host this event. Thank you to the English department for um, offering um, financial funds to help compensate Maggie for her time to do this lecture and to the gender and sexuality studies department who always supports me at UNCA. Welcome Maggie, thank you so much. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna start here with um, a screen share before I get into my own um, thank yous. So hopefully you are looking at a PowerPoint screen now. Um, I, I always say to my students, um, feel free to unmute and yell at me if you're not seeing something that, that you should be. Hi, I'm Maggie Werner, and thank you so much for signing on today. Um, I want to start by thanking Dr. Amanda Ray, UNCA's English Department and Gender and Sexuality Program, and Amanda's Gender and Sexuality students, and most especially Firestorm Books. Um, as Ash said, it is a super cool and important um, activist feminist space in Asheville. And whether you're in Asheville or not, I urge you to support them. All right, so I'm going to talk to you just a little bit about how the book works and then a little bit longer um, about the specific part of the book that we're discussing today. Um, and then we'll go into Q&A. So thank you for bearing with me while I rant for a while. So I am joining you today from the traditional territory of the Onondaga, which means the people of the Great Hill. They're one of the six nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. So thank you always to the Haudenosaunee people for continuing to host me. I also wanna start with a quick trigger warning. We're going to be discussing sex work and sex trafficking. So if any of the material causes you harm in any way, please do what you need to do to take care of yourself. In 2020, my book Stripped was published by Penn State University Press. By far my most important source was and has always been erotic performers and sex workers themselves. So I wanna start by acknowledging that they are the actual experts. I am not myself a sex worker, um, but I do like to think of myself as trying to carry that message into academic spaces where it's not always heard or heard correctly. 
one of the reasons that I wanted to write the book was that I f saw really not many scholars who were talking about bodies, looking at them as anything other than text. And this was particularly true in my field of rhetoric. You know, I mean, rhetoric is a generally about language, um, but people would talk about rhetoric, the body, and then read it as this flattened text. So stripped then is my way of sharing what I've learned by presenting different lenses for analyzing the body, um, ones that take into account both uh, symbols like text and materiality. Each chapter takes a different performance. And I use that word really broadly. So I can mean a burlesque show on the stage, uh, lap dance or street protest. And that last one is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I put that with a different lens and the lens is one that I found enables us to look at bodies as these living, breathing, sweating, moving uh, creators of rhetoric, but ones that are still enabled and constrained by discourse. All right, so the bodies of sex workers is going to be my primary focus today and how they work as in the activist spaces, particularly in street protest. Um, these bodies and people who are profiled as sex workers are seen by many to exemplify victimhood and criminality. And it's these characterizations that sex work activism both seeks and struggles to counteract. Although sex work activists have long fought to remake their identities and, and in order to emphasize that humanity and to lessen the stigma of their jobs, um, institutional policy, policing, and rhetoric constructs se sex workers as always embodying criminality. Now there's another story too, and that comes from certain feminist and social service analyses um, that argue that sex workers don't exist. There's only prostituted women whose bodies aren't in their own control, who are victims or survivors of abuse and rape, but who are not, who cannot be workers. Now I'm gonna talk with you about what I found when I analyzed the 2018 stripper protest in New Orleans protest which show the body playing a significant role in remaking or what I'm going to refer to today as rearticulating sex worker and in particular stripper identities. The protest followed a series of raids by police in clubs on Bourbon Street. Now the analysis frames these protests in the context of the ongoing struggles about sex worker identity. And I suggest that stripper protesters embodied counter stories, bolster efforts to reframe identity. Um, and that's because through protests, they're visibly refuting common narratives of victimhood and criminality. In this particular analysis, I use the theory of articulation and it's a complicated theory, but it, it, what it boils down to is that all identities are composed of connected or articulated. Articulate just means joined together. So like this joint here, that's a point of articulation. So identities, themes produce elements, elements are joined together, articulated to make identity. Now I like this theory because it helps me to identify the ways that dancer activists like unlink activity or I'm sorry, unlink elements and relink them in order to remake identity. All right, now what we see in New Orleans is anti-trafficking forces there, and this happens elsewhere too, but what we see is a, what I call in the book, a signifying slide that goes from sex work to sex trafficking, and it ends up rendering those things inseparable. Particularly in New Orleans, what we saw was a signifying slide from stripping to prostitution to sex trafficking. Now, when I use the word prostitution, I do want to note that I'm following Melissa Grant in her book, Playing the Whore. Um, I'm doing this specifically because it's a term that's central to the debates and in anti-sex work discourse. Uh, prostitute is not a preferred term. Um, also, I highly recommend this book if you are interested in sex work. I learned very, very much from it. All right, just a tiny bit of history. Um, sex work activism in the US appeared first as a movement for prostitute rights. And this was concurrent with the rise of gay liberation, feminism, black power, and other of what were referred to as the new social movements of the mid 20th century. 
Initially framed by discussions of sexual liberation and women's rights, by the end of the 1970s, activists had begun to articulate a new identity for themselves. And that was that of worker. This partially occurred because um, feminism and gay liberation both did not wanna be associated with prostitutes. So this shift toward worker rights was signaled by the widespread adoption of the term sex work. And that was coined by prostitute and um, activist Carol Lee, known as the Scarlet Harlot. Um, she used it in her one woman play, The Unrepentant Whore in 1978. So these terms sex work and sex worker highlight elements of labor, advocacy, agency, and then they de-emphasize elements of immorality, criminality, and victimhood. The terms also serve as a means of political organizing um, because they unite both le legal and illegal as well as higher and lower value jobs. And I'm thinking here of something like escort versus street sex worker. So the terms do this somewhat, at least, by taking the focus off of specific sexual acts and putting it on the job. So sex modifies the work and work is the central term. Now these expansive terms help to build political coalition among disparate groups of sex workers. The terms also, and this is a big point of debate that we're gonna talk about, but the term sex work also distinguish between enslavement persons who have been trafficked and forced into working in the sex industry and chosen sex work. I want to stop and emphasize at this point and or stop yeah stop talking and emphasize that sex work activists argue that not all sex work and sex workers are a result of trafficking, all right? Not that sex trafficking doesn't exist on a grotesque and damaging scale. But if we don't make this distinction between enforced and chosen sex work, uh, we can further harm victims of sex trafficking because we're turning attention away from them and their particular needs and to this population that's consistently saying they're not in need of help. Also, when we collapse this distinction, it tends to obscure other types of trafficking, including domestic work, agricultural labor, manufacturing and service industries, um, and that affects men and women and children. The National Trafficking Hotline reports that worldwide experts believe that there are more situations of labor trafficking than of sex trafficking, but it gets much far, I'm sorry, far less press than sex trafficking, which makes it more difficult to respond to and also conceals the crimes of those wealthy people who are purchasing humans. All right, so in addition to the problems evident in conflating chosen and forced sex work, the element of choice itself is a complicated, I, we can even say fraught one. Uh, first, Melissa Grant argues that insisting on proving choice exists places a burden on sex workers that we don't expect with regard to other jobs. She writes, as if the choice to engage in a form of labor is what makes that labor legitimate. Second, it's important to note that the idea of choice is fairly moot in a capitalist society organized around vastly unequal distributions of resources. While one may choose to do sex work rather than work at a lower wage job with more time restrictions, this choice is not a free choice. It is dictated by material realities. All right, so sex work and sex worker are inclusive. They can build coalition, but as part of that, they can also obscure many legal and personal privileges that are granted to higher static workers, status workers. For example, people who work as legal escorts perform, perform their work indoors, they're protected by law, and they can earn high rates. While people who sell sex on the street are performing illegal work outdoors and generally for less pay than legal escorts. So the term sex work, like the work itself, is deployed unequally. And street sex workers, in particular women of color, in most particular trans women of color, bear the brunt of the personal and institutional violence leveled against all sex workers. 
All right, so let's step back and those are the benefits and some of the constraints of the term sex work. Now let's look at the antagonistic argument um, that disavows the use of the term sex work. A common argument about sex work and sex worker is that they don't exist because they cannot exist. For sex work antagonists, freely chosen sex work is a fiction because one cannot choose to be a slave. Therefore, all sex workers have been to one degree or another trafficked, either explicitly through kidnapping, isolation, threats, abuse, or implicitly through poverty, racism, and sexism. So to antagonists, the term does not represent this grassroots laudable effort by activists to re-articulate marginalized identities. It represents a top-down marketing campaign by men who control and profit from the sex industry. All right, what you see here is an open letter from the associate, to the Associated Press from the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women. Um, this is a letter from 2014 after the AP adopted the terms sex work and sex worker. The letter demonstrates the rejection of these words as, as acceptable terms. So it represents both arguments about that particular phrase and the core of the debates about um, between anti-trafficking, anti-prostitution activists and sex work activists. Several important themes in this letter explain why antagonists reject the term sex worker. These themes produce the elements that sex work antagonists link to create the identity of the prostituted or trafficked person. First, the theme of prostitution both counteracts the expansiveness offered by sex work and narrows it down to focus on a mostly illegal job with entrenched negative associations. The second theme is social status and gender. The coalition letter ties sex worker not to the people who perform the labor, but with the traffickers, pimps, procurers, brothel and strip club owners, and the buyers of sex. Now these people are labeled as beneficiaries and workers are defined as vulnerable individuals marginalized by poverty, homelessness, racial and gender discrimination and histories of sexual abuse. The last theme in the letter that's stressed is ownership of the term sex worker. Now the coalition makes a really clever rhetorical move here by saying that the sex work was invented by the sex industry and its supporters, rather than Carol Lee, the letter implies a different history, that men in control of the industry, not the workers, created the term sex work. This underscores the coalition's argument that sex worker agency is a fiction by removing the power to self-identify. All right, now that you have some context for the overall argument, I want to show an example of a protest in which bodies um, countered these narratives um, by presenting counter arguments. All right, the next slides of protest that you're gonna see come from New Orleans in 2018. Over a period of 10 days in January, 2018, Louisiana Alcohol and Tobacco Control, the ATC, and the New Orleans Police Department, the NOPD, raided and shut down eight clubs in the French Quarter after months of undercover operations instigated by claims in a local newspaper that Bourbon Street strip clubs were a hub for sex trafficking. Club, closing, club closings after the raids resulted in hundreds of dancers being out of work. On February 1st, dancers held an unemployment march on Bourbon Street, chanting slogans like, let us dance carrying signs critiquing the purported links between sex work and human trafficking, calling out the authorities and asserting their humanity. Now this clip I'm gonna play from dancer activist AZ sums up these themes. And I've got the text up here in the left corner. You think I'm being trafficked? You think I have a pimp? You think I don't have a voice for myself? But I can speak up. I am a woman. This is my body. And I feel sad about it. Here, AZ asserts her authority and her bodily autonomy, two things that her op opponents claim she doesn't have. 
Not only does she reference her body and her ownership of it, she's doing so while standing in a protest march, identifying herself both as a stripper and as an activist, defying the stigmatized identity that the discourse of the raids has put upon her. She uses her body to re-articulate her identity as a worker, as a woman, as an activist, rather than as a slave, a victim, and a criminal. All right, um, I'm gonna step back just a second to step out of my presentation mode and discuss what we see here on the slide. Um, these are some signs from the unemployment march on the far um, left of your screen, you're going to see one that says Mitch and Shitty Hall are Nola's biggest pimps. This is a reference to then Democratic Mayor Mitch Landrew. Um, in the middle is a real common sign in sex worker activism. It says, stop saving me. This is a call out to what's referred to as the rescue industry. Um, and finally, on the far right, we've got um, a stripper heel, stripper shoe. Um, it's a pretty common symbol. Uh, it's a lucite heel, probably six to eight inches. Um, yeah, so this is part of that material symbolic. So in addition to their presence in the protest, these bodies display um, what you can think of as a multi-coded rhetoric, um, the movement, the clothing, the cosmetics. These are all realms of the body that communicate symbolically, but through material means. During the march, some dancers wore their work clothes and danced in the middle of Bourbon Street. Now these displays are usually performed for money in clubs, but here they serve to raise awareness and assert agency. The movements, clothes, makeup, mark them as strippers, and the addition of signs underscores that identity, but also makes them identifiably activist. All right, in this next slide on the far left side, you see solidarity with service workers. Um, the next is probably my favorite sign. It says boobs for beads equals yes, boobs for money equals no, and the O's are made into little boobs. Um, this is calling out the hypocrisy of New Orleans, which urges tourist traffic to Bourbon Street to engage in the time-honored tradition of drunk um, young women, usually college girls, um, flashing their breasts for plastic beads. So that's okay, that's desirable, but women making money for showing their breasts is not. The next sign over is human trafficking my ass. Again, this is sort of directed at the rescue industry. And then this dancer up front here is doing some common dance moves. You can see she's popping her hip there. She's also wearing fishnets, which is a common sex worker symbol. Here, I wanna make a quick plug um, if you're interested in, in this kind of um, clothing stuff. The Instagram account Sex Worker Style is run by sex worker and activist, burlesque teacher, Joe Weldon, um, and they just had a post on fishnets. Okay, some more signs. We've got um, on the left, starting on the left, we have stripper rights or human rights. In the middle, we've got Mitch's cheap political shot is more lewd than my pubic hair. Um, and on the bottom right here, we have, this is Bourbon Street, not Sesame Street. Um, so that's kind of a shout out to the city for trying to clean up Bourbon. There's one you can't see here, but if you look at this blue sign that says, hey, Mitch, it, it calls out the fact that zero trafficking victims were found in the raids. So all of these images from the march show the bodies of activists who are also dancers, sex workers who are also people, those dancers who are performing in the streets draw attention to the hypocrisy of governments of New Orleans and Louisiana, which have long profited from tourist traffic to strip clubs on Bourbon and from NOLA's ethos, of which sex work and sex workers are a large part. On January 31st, 2018, the day before the unemployment march, protesters interrupted a press conference, chanting and drowning out the city and tourist officials who were hoping to promote a new Bourbon Street, one that critics argue is evidence of its long planned Disneyfication. Um, the sign in the middle here said, says, there's still no police to protect me when I walk to my car after work, you know, pimps and murderers at 4 a.m. But hey, Bourbon is repaved, some, 
these protesters have continuously stressed that New Orleans' sex-positive environment makes working in the French Quarter Clubs a safer and more affirming experience than working other places, and that the raids and subsequent clo closings make dancers less safe by leaving them without income, a situation with which activists argue increases the likelihood of exploitation, prostitution, and drug dealing. Um, and just on that note, I want to point out there's two signs here, strip clubs feed families and raids hurt families. Um, so again, this is about the economic benefits of, of stripping. Now these protests is in March, protests in March produce um, counter stories to official or stock stories of victimhood and criminality. Stock stories are powerful to tools because they, and this is in the words of Dr. Asia Martinez, stock stories feign neutrality and any stories that counter stock stories are deemed biased, self-interested, and ultimately not credible. Now, one stock narrative about strippers describes the strip club as a zone controlled by pimps and traffickers. And in another stock story, and this is one favored by law enforcement, Strippers are always criminals, always less than full citizens. The stock stories about strippers work on two levels. Their circulation renders competing narratives as unimaginable because the stories themselves render their subjects as incapable of telling those stories. Okay, so it's like a snake eating its tail. Both counter story and counter story teller are delegitimized at once. In the case of the NOLA protest, Counter story operates as an embodied, a specifically embodied rhetorical form through the physical presence of the protesters, through sharing the benefits of dancing on Bourbon Street and emphasizing it as a chosen and even desired profession, dancer activists disarticulate stripping from trafficking. Further, they re-articulate the violence of the stock story with their opponents, arguing that yes, strippers are victimized by violence, but that that comes from efforts used against them and their jobs. Bringing attention to harm expansion was one of the recurring themes in the NOLA strippers counter stories. Some dancers have accused undercover agents of taking pictures of them on their cell phones, using abusive language and forcing them to change clothes with only male officers present. In a tweet to Bear, the Bourbon Alliance of Responsible Entertainers, one dancer writes, the police laughed and said, you lost your right to decency when you became a stripper. The officer here criminalizes all strippers, not only those accused of crimes, not only those in the Bourbon Street raids, but all strippers. He represents law enforcement and the legal system and all those who denigrate and harass dancers in the name of harm reduction. By sharing their experiences during the raids and asserting their rights, these dancers stress both their humanity and their violation at the hands of the officers, offering counter stories to stock victimization narratives. However, as the police state in the US repeatedly makes clear an assertion of rights is far from a recognition of rights. History shows that workers in industries that employ large numbers of working class women, and in particular women of color, are rarely listened to. But whether or not they are heard or willfully ignored, the Bourbon Street protesters demonstrated a powerful embodied rhetoric. Their bodies tell counter stories about their bodies, about dancer activists who are not only waging a battle for their jobs, but also for their existence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Warner. I'm trying to find my clap so I could clap for you. Um, we, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica, who's going to pose a couple of dis question, discussion questions for you. You. Sounds good. Um, we'll take do some Q&A. Before we wrap up here, I will um, give you a little bit of information about the resources that I've got here on the screen. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the first question that we really wanted to ask you is what motivated you to advocate and to speak out for sex workers against criminalization of the industry? 
All right. Thanks. That's a really good question. And I'm going to take it, but my nose is itching really bad. So everybody hang on. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I've been like dying to do that. Um, I don't, there's no easy answer to that. It's a good question. I think I was motivated by a few different things personally. Um, one was just my, I, I had an interest in sexual rhetoric for a really long time and sexuality. Um, and then my time in graduate school, um, spending time in strip clubs, uh, made me sort of see like sex work up close and personal. And also, I mean, oh gosh, I was, uh, I was benefiting from that sex work, you know, mm -hmm. I, and I didn't see, um, I didn't see what, what other people were saying was going on there. Um, and then I started writing about it and it would just be like, it, it's the, the, the word I followed a feminist action research principles. So there's just no way that I would come in and, and research it and not give back in some way. And I used to give back by spending lots and lots of money in clubs. And now I try to give back by, by talking about it. So I think it was partially personal. Um, and partially just seeing what I thought was really untrue and unjust about the way sex workers were talked about. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Um, how do we support victims of sex trafficking without hindering or victimizing other sex workers that were not coerced? That's also a good question. And, and I think it's, a, <laughs> I think it's a difficult question and um, I'll tell you why and I'll give you my best answer. Um, I think my best answer is that um, if you're interested in supporting sex workers, if that is the thing that you are interested in, then you go to organizations that specifically say that they support sex workers. I am at the point in the debate where I think that almost all sex worker organizations oppose trafficking in one degree or another. Um, most, even if that's not part of like in their name or something, um, almost all organizations like, like say the, the Black Sex Workers Collective, they, they don't present themselves as an anti-trafficking organization, but they help people get out of the industry who want to get out of the industry. Um, something like the Sex Workers Project explicitly formed around helping trafficking victims and explicitly says that they support sex workers. So to me, the first step is disarticulation, right? Like if people tell you that they are not trafficked, like we cannot say, yes, you are. You're brainwashed, you know, yes, you are. I mean, it's like Western feminists telling women who wear hijabs that they're oppressed. I mean, we can't, we can't do that. You know, you, if you care about these women, you have to listen. So first step, disarticulate. Second step, um, I think if you support sex workers, you will support trafficking victims. I mean, and again, you know, reach out to organizations that are explicitly helping sex workers and say, what can I do? Cool. Um, you mentioned an Instagram uh, that had like some activism for the sex work. I think it was something about fashion. Could you, do you know what the handle is for that? Yeah, it's actually sex worker style. That's one word. It's run by Joe Weldon, who is herself um, a burlesque teacher, a sex work activist, um, still performs burlesque, used to be a stripper. Um, brilliant writer. So that account in particular is about fashion. So she posts about leopard prints and the recent thing. So people who are like, cool, I like clothes. I think clothes are interesting. Um, she has a whole book about leopard print, um, but she has a recent post about fishnets in particular. So that's sex worker style. Cool. I just looked down and I realized I'm wearing like a leopard print. I'll have to follow that. You gotta, okay. So she has a book called everyone. She's got a book called fierce and it's about leopard print. Not, not really like I'm a little too like butch for that probably, but it, she's a wonderful writer and she is very, very brilliant. Cool. Um, so 
You said that at the beginning, you wanted to carry that message into academic spaces. Why is it important for um, academia to be involved? I know, I mean, like, part of me is like, shut up academics, like, <laughs> like, but I think because a lot of feminist work happens in academia. Mm -hmm. um, and I also see like part of the change has already happened. Like it is not unusual for me to meet people um, who are undergraduates who are like right there with say in sex worker, but they're not necessarily aware of like the, the, the conflation with trafficking or that there's some damaging happening in the damage happening in the name of harm reduction. So one, it's to like reach students and two, I guess I just kind of wanted to, I was like really bothered when I was reading about rhetoric of the body. And this is just a personal thing with me and my discipline and the gods of rhetoric. Nobody was actually talking about sexual bodies and um, they might talk about like gay and lesbian and queer identities, but they weren't talking about like these moving, sweating, doing bodies. And, and that kind of was like, how can we leave this huge aspect of human experience out of rhetoric of the body. Um, and so then academics, we, we also tend to screw up a lot. So we tend to, and one of the ways that we tend to screw up and I am not absolving myself. I, there's so many things that I would do different in every project I've ever done. But one of the ways that we screw up is that we get super proud of ourselves for knowing a lot about things, but we don't know a lot about things that are outside of books. And so, um, I just kind of wanted to remind other academics that that there's people that these aren't just debates that these are about people's lives, you know, and we need to listening to people um, is not an abstraction. Yeah, I think that's great. How do you think we should go on like, talking about sex work with people who have a really negative view on it? It's not easy. I mean, I'm going to tell you that right there, right now. It's not easy. And it was, I still kind of cringe talking about it because it is hard. It's not hard so much talking about sex work. What's hard talking about is criticizing trafficking rhetoric. That's what's hard. So because it starts, it's very easy to get caught up in the, so what, you're not opposed to human trafficking, like, you know, like anything that criticizes the rhetoric is then criticizing that I'm like, yeah, go human trafficking, you know, which is not it. That's the scary part. That's the difficult part because that's where, you know, as a feminist, I worry about getting misunderstood by other feminists. And I want to be one of those people that says, I just, I don't give a crap if I'm misunderstood, but I'm still like, no, I want you to I want you to understand, like, I really want you to hear this because it's literally bad for women to ignore, to ignore them, you know? And gosh, I forgot what, where the question was. What was, it? where did we start? Like how to do? Um, how to like speak to people who really disagree. Oh. Okay. Best advice I have is just to say, you know, have you listened to, to what, you know, have you read stuff by sex workers? who have talked about their own experiences working in the sex industry, you know, and if they say yes, and they're victims and they were trafficked, you know, like, well, what do you think about women who, you know, I mean, there's no denying that there are women who, who say that that's not happening to them. What about the Desiree Alliance? What about the Black Sex Workers Collective? What about the Outlaw Project? You know, um, what about swaps? Those are sex, sex worker out, out, outreach projects, you know? And just sort of like, I think as long as you, what's the word that's um, popular? Um, push, amplify. As long as you're amplifying the voices of the workers themselves, I think that you've done the most that you can do. And at some point you have to, you know, say that what you're concerned about is helping women. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Isn't it weird that we're having a conversation and there's like people listening to us and we yeah. can't see them? Yeah. <laughs> Um, 
how do you think we can normalize sex work in the same way we normalize the consumption of sexual services like porn? Yeah, okay. So I'm probably going to do like the annoying academic thing and we're going to kind of redirect that question because um, th this is Mia. Um, because I don't think porn consumption is normalized. Like, I think that there's a difference between being um, abundant in a society and being like, it's no big deal. You know, I do think, I mean, if you think of some ways, I mean, when in the seventies, there were big screen movie theaters showing two hour long porns that people would get dressed up and go out to have like, nights out on the town you know you know in some ways it's become more sh like shameful and hidden um than in some of its heyday so so i don't actually think porn has been normalized i think it's still kind of a um a dirty secret i do think that what we've seen is we've seen things that used to be considered pornographic in sort of mainstream culture you know like even i, I this is something that happens jessica since it's just us here you know what you'll see when you get older is there's stuff that you watch and you're like oh my god they're showing this now and I mean I used to be I'm just like always consider myself a sex radical and now I see stuff on tv and I'm like oh they can just say blah blah on tv now oh okay so I think that in some ways we've seen things that used to would have not been in the, on like um television shows on and and in music and in movies but in other ways, I don't think that necessarily means that it that it's normalized. So I think that that's that's part of the question that that I would redirect. I think the the more critical question is how do we sort of take stigma off of sex work? Um, and really, all we can do for that is just to sort of like watch our own language, you know, watch like use of like talking about whores, you know, like using that term, listen to our language, why are we doing it? It's really easy. And as a feminist, this can be really easy too, to denigrate men who visit strip clubs. And let me tell you, another reason I wanted to do this work is because I was reading all this this stuff written by strippers and it was like it was psychologizing men who went to strip clubs at the time that I was at my top going to strip clubs five times a week and I'm like wow so am I all these things you know are these you know so I think it, it's hard at, to sort of take that to stop assuming that people who consume sexual services are somehow um sick or less than or you know or anything other than meeting certain needs in certain ways. Yeah. All right. Um, why do you think sex trafficking has been associated with prostitution? Um, I think because, I mean, I think part of the way that it has gotten tangled up is because that's like, primarily when we think about, I mean, sex trafficking, that's what we're thinking of doing, like people being put on the street to make money, you know, that's like sort of, um, although they, people do get trafficked into strip clubs, that's kind of the core of what, of what happens with sex trafficking. Someone is sold to someone else, um, which is kind of how we think of prostitution, although it's not selling a person, it's selling a service. So um, I think that because of what sex trafficking like distills down to is probably the closest to what we think of as prostitution. Now, why is it, why have they become inseparable? I think that there's a lot of reasons for that. And I think part of it is because there's a lot of tra um, traction around trafficking right now. And again, it's one of those things that um, people don't say I'm pro-trafficking, you know, they are, so it's sort of an easy way, I say easy, I'm not trying to denigrate anti-trafficking work, although some of it is very terrible. Um, it's a way to sort of get certain agendas passed under a, um, a name that people are like, yes, that's a bad thing. 
you know, and so that's, I think that it's had a lot of, it's easier to say I'm anti-trafficking than to say I'm anti-prostitute, you know, it takes away, um, it changes the focus. But what we find is that um, sex workers get caught up in that. Yeah, gotcha. Um, what were some of the challenges you experienced in doing this research and how'd you work through it? I mean, it's gone on for so long when it, when I was in grad school, um, exhaustion, you know, I was, I was partying a lot while I was doing this, you know, I was like very, very caught up in the life, you know? Um, and, and so that was it. And then when I moved here, um, I'm in a small town, um, there were no strip clubs, but I was, I was emotionally beat and so I started turning to burlesque well being in a small town there's no strip clubs there's I have to drive an hour to see any burlesque um so it was just like my my environment completely shifted um you know there there's other things like feeling like I can't do enough like that always learning like learning and wishing I had said things differently or done things differently in the book um you know so those are those are all my sort of selfish challenges and getting it getting to talk to people is hard you know i mean a lot of um you know so a lot of i could talk to a lot of burlesque performers but talking to um like street sex workers just wasn't something that i was able to make happen also for anybody who writes a book getting permissions is the worst thing that you'll ever have to do getting photo permissions getting you know it's it's just so that was there was some like just like when you want to do ethnography having to get from permission from people is exhausting that was a crappy answer let's move on okay are there any books you'd recommend on the subject of sex work or the workers themselves I recommend Playing the Whore, The Work of Sex Work by Melissa Grant. Um, it's super, it's an easy read. I've, you can see that I've tagged like every single page. Um, she, she hits hard and she just goes right into, um, she covers a lot. She's a journalist. So it's written for a popular, not scholarly audience. Um, I think that that is an excellent starting point um th and otherwise i would you know there's a lot of just like you can learn from twitter and facebook pages and and going online you can learn a lot as long as you're looking at things that are about sex workers but this is like my my go-to if you want to start someplace start here and then it'll take you a million different places cool thank you I'll check that out uh and what... then email me and let me know what you think about it okay <laughs> Um, what specific rights are important to sex workers? I mean, I think that what is included under the banner of sex work is, um, it sort of depends. Um, but what they're generally talking about or what people are generally talking about is um, decriminalization. Um, not necessarily legalization. Um, if you know anything about um, the legalization of marijuana, it ends up actually, legalization can end up hurting people who are in these shadow economies. Um, so mostly decriminalization, leaving, um, leaving people alone to do their work. Um, at the same time, um, it's very complicated. So at the same time, having some kind of um, work protections um there's so strippers usually in clubs are um defined as independent contractors um and this is something that there's no universal some people are like yeah i want to stay independent contractor but part of the problem of that status is that there's no like protection so clubs will say you work here you dance to this music you dress this way you work these hours, you have to go talk to this customer that you don't want to, um, but then say, well, that's not my employee, you know? So it's like a lot of times what happens with dancers is they get all the negatives of having to um, work for someplace and no, no, you know, no protection, no OSHA protections, being in dressing rooms that are falling apart, having, you know, plumbing that's broken. Um, so 
people want safe places to work. They want protection from the law because if you're in an illegal economy and something happens to you, you have no recourse, you know? So they want the same things that everybody wants. You know, they wanna be treated fairly. They wanna be able to do their job. They wanna be able to earn, you know, money um, and not be sort of the dredges of society in the way that they're talked about and treated. They're people, you know? Yeah. Um, so would you argue for, like for or against legalization of sex work across the US? It's not my place to, to answer that question. I would default to where um, sex workers I know um, and the, the things that I know people discuss criminalization, decriminalization. So um, without seeing specific ways that it is enacted and what is gonna be the result, um, I would more support decriminalization, but also again, I. I, I would default to what are the organizations, what are sex workers themselves saying? What are they saying? And then I would make my decision to support. It's almost always local though. You're not gonna get the same things in Salt Lake City as you're gonna get in Vegas. You know, like, like this is what we're gonna have. Okay. Um, what's the line between being an ethical and unethical consumer of sex work or services? Are there changes you'd like to see in clubs or how people support strippers and interact in those spaces? Okay. Um, I mean, I think that the, the, where people get to be unethical consumers of any type of sex work and what I've seen particularly is in strip clubs is the sort of assumption that because you've given someone a dollar that you have a right you have like somehow bought something off of them that you have a right to um, kiss them on the mouth touch their breasts you know pull down their pants you know any sort of things that like it, it does happen so yeah, that's unethical behavior. I think ethical behavior is tipping. I'm going to put tipping on there because, you know, if you're not there to tip, um, go somewhere else. You know, this is tip, you got to have bills, you know, like that's how you, that's how they work. So tip, um, treat them as people, treat any strippers and sex workers as people. They're people, but also understand that your money is buying you a service. It's not buying you a person. Um, and they ultimately have bodily autonomy, um, even though, yes, you threw a dollar bill on the stage. Changes, it's too location dependent to say, um, but I think really having um, women who are workers, having some kind of sense that, you know, problem is that most clubs are owned by men. Um, and and there's just not a lot of, of women who have power in these situations. And that doesn't mean you can't have an ethical strip club that's, that's run by a man. Um, but I think it, it's just too, it's too loose and unregulated. At the same time, we gotta understand that regula regulation would bring with it harm probably too and risk putting people out of work. So the thing I want to see is the most women making the most money in the most healthy way possible with their their arts. Right. Okay. Um, well, that's all the questions I've seen so far. Uh, Can I ask a question? No. <laughs> Um, so you said earlier that, you know, you would maybe do things different if you were going back to redo this project. Um, I can imagine what some of those differences might be, but I just wonder in terms of like gathering voices in your research, um, what might have been some of the things you would have done differently or more of or less of or? Um, more trans women, more black women, like just, um, you know, I can make my excuses for why those things didn't happen, um, but it's it was that's that's what needs to happen. I you know, um, particularly trans women's voices because 
I was mostly dealing with burlesque and stripping and trans women aren't found there's there's a great tra- quote by a trans woman to say they don't want women like me in there so um strip clubs tend to be around a certain type of of women and they tend to um shun trans women and that doesn't mean that there are no trans women working in clubs but that would be something that i would have liked to deal because the most precarious sex workers in general are black trans women you know and speaking of um when I was talking about the signifying slide, like all strippers become um, prostitutes, become trafficked people, um, what happens with Black trans women in public is that they automatically become pr- prostitutes. You know, there's a phenomenon called walking while trans, and this happened to Monica Jones, um, who is a master's student in soci- uh, social work at the Arizona State University, and she was arrested. So uh, it's like, so many black trans women are arrested on suspicions of sex work or they're somehow, they are sex workers because they're black and they're trans, you know? So they talk about like the way that these discourses shape bodies. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's the big one, Amanda. There's, there's other things. Yeah, you don't really talk, at least in this chapter, so much about race. Can you talk about why that was? Just access or? um... I think because the NOLA protests were giving me, that was the artifact that I was working with. So that gave rise to the, the analysis that I was doing. Um, I tried to call attention to it by at least talking about how the idea that this is deployed unequally, that the term is deployed unequally and the people who suffer more most are black trans women. But in terms of the, Oh, and the the coalition letter um, brought up the idea of of racialization. You know that racism is what leads to women into prostitution. So um, it was there, but it wasn't a an element that I particularly focus. Oh, and I um, the quote from Az: "She's a woman of color." So it was like it. it besides, it was it was just kind of embedded in what I was doing. But, you know, it's a fair point. There's um, in the introduction, what I say is that race is always a part of what we're doing. You know, race is, you cannot separate, you can't talk about these things without talking about race. Yeah. Could you talk about everyday rhetorical agency? Like how much and where do we have power to rearticulate oppressive ideas? Um. You know, that's my question, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, mm. So in articulation theory, Stuart Hall talks about how some articulations are more tenacious than others. So they grab on more tightly. So here, think of a, a train, like trains are a common like metaphor for articulation because they're joined together at that articulation point. So say you've got a train and its little ball joint there is rusted and you can't pull it apart anymore. That's a tenacious articulation. So power is the thing that makes some articulations more entrenched and more difficult to dis and rearticulate. So I think it's difficult to say, like these are the situations where it's hard and these are the situations where it's possible. Now even though some articulations are tenacious, articulation, re-articulation is always possible. So another thing, important thing that Hall says is that those connections are non-necessary, all right? So that means that they're always capable of being dis and re-articulated. So that, what that means for everyday sort of activist language is that we can always speak to re-articulate. You know, we can always be articulating the identities that we want. Now, 
how much is that globally going to be picked up? Well, for the individual activist, it doesn't matter. You know, like we always speak to rearticulation. And it's through that individual that we start a global transformation. You know, you can only sort of speak to your own um, agency. So what I say to that is, yeah, sometimes you have power to change, um, but you always have power to sort of like at least give voice to your own, you know, how you see things, to articulate your own identity. Like, I'm going to pull these things together to make my identity and not these other things. But, you know, what we've seen with sex work is those terms have really taken off. Um, and I talk about this in the chapter a little bit more, but at the same time that those terms have gained real traction, the anti-trafficking movement has really gained um, a momentum too. And for anybody who's in here, if you don't know, um, FOSTA, which is Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act, and SESTA, Stop Enabling Sex Trafficking Act, were both signed into law by Donald Trump. Um, and these laws, um, bipartisan support, um, they're incredibly damaging to sex workers, incredibly. I mean, it makes it so a group like the Desiree Alliance can't have a conference because sex workers can't speak to other, one another. Like sex workers can't reach out to each, each other over digital environments or they'll be arrested. You know, like there's ways that, all this is to say that, so that rearticulation of sex worker has taken off, but it hasn't stopped this other, the sort of like, nightmare of, of um, bad trafficking laws taking over it. So that doesn't really answer your question, but it's just like, we always, it, it's always dependent, It's but you always have the right and the ability to speak it. In the book, you take some real risks, like sharing personal information and telling parts of your story and just you're, as you were with us, being really transparent about your presence in the strip clubs and, and that kind of stuff. I wonder, like, were you afraid about being transparent about that? Um, you know, how, how do you make that decision to just like go all in like that? Yes, I was really scared. And if my mom's in here today, I was scared partially, which I think she is. I was scared partially because I knew my mom was going to read the book. So everything that I was doing, I thought, well, my mom's going to read this. Um, so that was one of the first like things that was hard to talk about. Now, I actually have a really um, specific moment when it happened to me. I was really struggling with it. And I went to a reading on campus by a writer named Melissa Phoebos. Um, she wrote a book called uh, Whip Smart. Um, and now the other book is, it's not down here, of course, is I'm blanking, but, but she just like straight up was like writing really explicitly about um, these lesbian sex scenes. And she was talking about giving a reading with her like dad in the front row. And I'm like, oh, wow, wow. And I was just like, that's super brave, you know? And so I was like, I respect Melissa Febo. So, she's a brilliant writer. I respect her so much. Um, I need to just be brave, you know? <laughs> like I just need to, to be brave um, and it will be better if I am. And Amanda, it's also too sort of that feminist action research thing. Like it feels like everyone is risking so much who's a sex worker, you know? Like, am I just gonna sit here and benefit my own career, you know, without some kind of risk? So it just, it just kind of felt like the right thing to do. And also, it is a time in my life that I really value, you know, as bad as it was for me in some ways, I really like value that and what I learned from it. So I just wanted to say, look, yeah, I was getting drunk in strip clubs. I was paying, well, we don't have to go into that, but I was paying for stuff. And, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm not a human trafficker and the women I was with were not, traffic and they had things to say and they were just they were people so I guess I just kind of wanted to bring that humanity to it what sorts of things have people said about the book this is your first book right yes. and 
How's it feel to get a book out? And what sorts of things have you heard people say about it? Um, well, not a lot because I was expecting to do, to be traveling and um, giving readings and promoting it. And thanks to you and Firestorm, this is the first moment that I've had to sort of do that. Um, so, so I don't really know. I don't really know what reception um, is, is um, to it or is it going to be. I mean, all my friends are like, that's cool. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I don't, I don't know what response is going to be. I think people are buying it though. It was on the book authorities lists of the um, best new books in rhetoric. So that makes me feel pretty good. Well, I think that has exhausted our questions. If there's anybody out there that has a question, please put it in the chat or in the Q&A. Well, I guess you can only put it in the Q&A. Jen Heckler was here earlier. She said to tell you hello, Maggie. Um, oh, no. She had to go, but she said, um, I wish I could say the entire time, but she has another meeting. Understandable. And um, Marisa and Erica and Asia are texting right now. And so they were sending you good vibes too. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, just really quick, I noticed that um, Ash is back. I just wanna like, sh just really quick um, pop up my screen to show you all some um, resources um, for local to, your area, there's a swap, which is anytime you guys see a swap, it's the sex worker outreach reach project. So they're all over the world. Um, Asheville has um, their own swap, Asheville swap. And the Facebook page is super active. It also is part of this umbrella organization called Our Voice. Um, and so there's the web page for Our Voice as well. And they do um, community work. Um, a few national links that I have, the National Best Practices Policy Project, um, the Desiree Alliance, and um, the Sex Workers Project. Looks like the Sex Workers Project, um, it looks a little old on, on the website. I'm not sure how up to date that is. Um, also, my absolute favorite, I wanted to give a shout out to the Black Sex Work Collective. It's, um, I'm wearing their t-shirt. Um, this is one of my absolute favorite organizations. Um, when you support Black sex workers, you support all sex workers. Um, so I just wanted to talk through those and that is all I have. Well, great. Thank you so much, Maggie, for that really, really thorough presentation and then fielding all those questions. I imagine I'm not the only one who learned something today. Um, and it's really cool. I didn't know that this was one of the first events that you were able to do with a bookstore to promote the book. Um, so for, for anybody who's still on the Zoom, I've dropped it in the chat a couple times, but I'll go ahead and do it again there uh, if you want to pick up the book through our website. Um, and yeah, thank you so much to Amanda and Jessica for helping make this conversation happen. Um, and fielding all our questions and moderating the q and A. I I think this was a really informative chat. Was there anything else y'all wanted to say before we sign off today? I just asked my students, all my WGSS students, if you could post your name in the chat real quick, that way I'll have a record of attendance or in the Q&A, which is where you all can post. Um, and just thank you so much, Dr. Warner, for joining us and educating us, broadening our scope of understanding. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, Ash. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Hope you have a good day. Bye.